put your hand over your mouth and come with us. You can be our advisor and priest. Wouldn't it be better to be a priest for a whole Israelite tribe than for just one man's family? And the priest was happy. And he took the effort and the personal items and the carved image and joined the group. So, <laughs> this is dumb, dumb, and dumber. <laughs> they come to this house. They said, by force, we're taking the stuff in this house. They broke it into the house, stolen the stuff. And on their way out, they say to the Levite, come with, you might as well come with us too. Because what are you going to do? There's no idol. What are you going to do? So come with us. It makes more sense for you to be with us a whole time. Basically, they were offering him a promotion. And he said, yes. Because we know our young Levite is very ambitious. And he has no sense of uh, direction, no sense of grounding, no foundation. He's just looking for the next big thing. And there's a lot of people ministering today that are like the young Levi. And all I want to say is beware of the people you follow. Because when you're following someone in a false ministry, that person has no loyalty to you. They don't truly care about your well-being. And what you'll find is, when they can, and once they've got everything out of you, they will move on. And you are left to deal with the rumors. So, we've established here, dysfunctional families, convenient Christianity, false ministries, Blind leading the blind. Next slide. 21. So they went on their way, but they walked behind the children, the cattle, and their possessions. After they had gone a good distance from Micah's house, Micah's neighbors gathered together and caught up with the Danites. When they called out to the Danites, uh, the Danites turned around and said to Micah, Why have you gathered together? He said, You stole my gods that I made, as well as this priest, and then went away. What do I have left? How can you have the audacity to say to me, What do you want? Then the Danites said to him, Please, do not say another word. Or some very Angry men kill you. I like the way they put this. <laughs> they said to him, listen, 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 listen. Just keep your mouth shut. I don't know who, but one of us will get very angry. <laughs> and they will do something that there's no coming back from. So you just keep your mouth shut. And the Danites went on their way. And when Michael realized they were too strong to resist, he turned them around and went home. Can you, can you imagine Michael said, you've taken my idols, you've taken my priest, what do I have left? This man was stinking rich. But he was so absorbed in his customized Christianity, he thought, yeah, I'm, I'm holding on to the real thing and I really need this. Next slide. So, verse 27. Now the Danites took what Micah had, as well as his priest, and came to Laish, where the people were undisturbed and unsuspecting. They struck them down with the sword and burned their city. No one came to the rescue because the city was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with them. And the city was in a valley near Beth Rehob. And the Danites rebuilt the city and occupied it. And they named it Dan, after their ancestor, who was one of Israel's sons. But the city's name 
used to be Laish. The Danites worshipped the carved image. Jonathan, the descendant of Gershom, son of Moses, and his descendants served as priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of exile. They worshipped Micah's carved image the whole time. God's authorized shrine was in Shiloh. So, sounds like happily ever after. The Danites go, they find lights, they kill everybody, and they take it for themselves. Now they finally have a space for themselves. Um, it seems like in verse 30, they finally give a name to the Levite, and his name is Jonathan, and they say he's a descendant of Gershom, who was son of Moses. And um, they worshipped the carved idol happily ever after. But the authorized shrine was in Shiloh. Now I want to talk about the knock-on effects of the things that I've uh, highlighted. So next slide, please. Once again, we've gone back to the map here. Yeah? So like I said, in that time, they didn't have church scattered all over the nation. You go to your church. Everybody went to the temple. They lived in the temple system. This is how God wanted it then. Yeah? Everybody went to the temple. Now, if you look at the um, map, remember this is where Dan were designated. This is where they were supposed to be. This is where Michael was. Yeah? Um, this is where the um, Levite came from. Yeah? Now, please. Look at where Shiloh is. Look at the proximity between Ephraim and Shiloh. If I'm Micah and I live in Ephraim, how long does it take me to get to Shiloh? Not that long. And still he insisted, no, I'm going to have my own temple in my own place. I'm not getting up and going to the temple like everyone else. Imagine, you're you from Naphtali, and yeah? you're making that whole journey to Shiloh, to the authorized place, and Micah is sitting next door at Ephraim, and he's saying, no, me, I'm doing things how I like them. And that's a lot of us today. A lot of us today in genuine churches, genuine ministers of God, um, encouraging us, pushing us. We have no excuse. We're, we're this, we, we see prime examples in front of us every day and we insist, me, I'm doing my own thing. Even, even let's make it physical. Come to church, come to church. At least one midweek. You live um, next door. But we don't see. <laughs> Listen, a lot of us are doing our customized Christianity and we think it only applies to us. And we have friends that are distant, distant from where they need to be, distant from God, distant from um, where God wants them to be. And we have the opportunity, imagine if the Danites were on their way and they came to Micah's house and they didn't meet no young Levi and they met Micah and Micah said, oh, wow, these guests, you caught me, but me, I'm on my way to prayer meeting at Shiloh. Come with me. Maybe they could have gone to Shiloh, did some prayer, God could have given them some direction how they're supposed to defeat the enemies in the place that they can't get them out of. And then they go back and they go and take what is rightfully theirs and they live their happy ever after. Instead, they met somebody that was doing his false thing. And what did they do? They ended up picking it up as well. And a lot of us have, I don't want to use this phrase, but we have that kind of blood on our hands. 
people that we are supposed to be the example of how you're supposed to really worship God, we're giving them a terrible example. And in the end, they pick it for themselves. Just look at the proximity between Ephraim and Shiloh. That's how, that's how, that's, that's the distance between some of us and true worshipping. But because we want to hold on to our customized, convenient Christianity, we don't make that short trip. And then you finally see Lysh. This is where that ended up. They were supposed to be here. They ended up here. The only reason why they ended up here is because the people, like the Bible says, they were unsuspecting. They were gentle. They were free. They didn't have any relation with the Sidonians or the Phoenicians. So when the um, Danites came to attack them, nobody came to support them. They were there on their own, ready for the taking. <coughs> Danites, the biggest tribe, you're supposed to be the strongest. You go and you take advantage of the weak. They, the Danites had a core problem. And what happened is we find that the idolatry that started here ends up here. Remember that the Israelites were chosen by God to be an example to the rest of the world. So if the Sidonian one day is going on his way somewhere there and he goes past the Danites, what will he find? What example will he find? False gods, idol worship. What example, what example is that? The wrong one. The wrong one. So that small, small idolatry that Michael thought was just for himself, that small, small wrong, that small, small disobedience, that small, small sin that he just thought, it just affects me. It ended up affecting a whole tribe. And that's something I want us to all grasp. Because sometimes it's very difficult. When you're doing wrong on your own, nobody knows. You think it's just you. You think it just affects you. But the knock-on effects can be generational. It can affect whole families. It can affect, go on to affect whole cities and whole nations. And we don't realize it. So, uh, very quickly, last slide. We have, we've gone into fifth game, we're coming back to the 21st century. And we've now arrived with the king of R&B. <laughs> so he's not quite the king of kings, but he's the king of R&B. Who knows who this man is? R. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just want to use R. Kelly's story to summarize everything that I've said. R. Kelly is widely regarded as the king of R&B. Yeah, he sold over 60 million um, albums. He's won Grammys. He's written for Michael Jackson, Celine Dion. He's top all the charts there, there is the top. He sang, I believe, I can fly. What more is there to do? If you're a musician, what more is there to do? Than to come with the song, I believe, I can fly. I used to sing it. He sang, I'm the world's greatest. <laughs> what more is there to do? But I want to quickly, quickly go through this story. R. Kelly this week was charged with 10 counts of sexual assault. Uh, three, uh, against four, on four people, three of those being minors, meaning below 16 years old. Okay. 
So, uh, on my way to work, when all of this was coming to light, I, I you know, YouTube has its album review, so it suggests, it suggests these videos. And I was really trying to keep up to date with what was going on with RME. Uh, not RME, R. Kelly. So, a video came up, and it was his brother, his younger brother, doing an interview. And the younger brother was going through some of the family history and all that. And the younger brother said that he himself was molested. And the younger brother said, R. Kelly was also molested. And he named a relative in the family that did the molesting. And R. Kelly himself has said he was molested, but he never said the family member. Um, so, bear in mind, this is a sin that's taken a this is a wrong, this is a sin that's taking place in one household, yeah? One family. But then, fast forward, R. Kelly becomes a superstar. He now has money, he have, now has power, he now has influence. And in the story, if you, follow, if you go and check the story, you basically see that there was a point early in his career where he had friends and managers and the people around him complicit with what he was doing. They were turning the blind eye and they were allowing him to get away with it. And what you find is that the actions of that molester went on to affect hundreds of girls, hundreds of families, and R. Kelly himself. And this is just like Michael and his soul idolatry and it ending up having an effect on a whole tribe for generations. Something that Michael thought is just for me, I'm doing it in my small corner. And then, another thing, at the time Arkham has previously been on trial. And at the time he went on trial, he came out with a gospel album. This is the cover of the gospel album. This one. There's a lot of chest on it, but it was a gospel album. <laughs> <laughs> and this man was singing. Well, if you go and listen to his gospel album, some of you saved me. Ah, if I play that track, <laughs> you would think this man was tapping into the spirit. Tapping in! But it was all false. It was all to cover up something else. It was all to serve his ambition. And then, on top of that, the church was opening, opening the doors for him to come and sing. Can you believe the first day of his trial, right after the trial, he went to a church to sing whatever song. <laughs> Can you believe he's on trial for uh, a videotape of a clear videotape of him molesting someone. And right after the trial, he goes into the church to see And this is, this, is, this is a reflection of the church. We're opening our arms to all sorts of ministers, ministrations, and we're allowing ambition to drive the direction of the church. We are allowing the calling of man to drive the direction of the church instead of the calling of God. After that trial, when he finally got off, his brother called him. And his brother said, Robert, I'm so glad, you know, <laughs> you got off. <laughs> he said, Rob, um, God, God delivered you. That's what the brother believed. He said, I believe God delivered you so you can have a second chance. 
you know what R. Kelly said to his brother? He said, God didn't leave me. My money delivered me. I delivered me. That was the first trial. That was the first trial. He's not getting away with me again this time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he doesn't even have money to deliver him this time. He said that explicitly from his mouth. We may not say that explicitly from our mouths, but a lot of us act in ways that indicate that we have a similar belief to Mr. Robert. We have a similar attitude. We have a similar perspective. And in the end, in the end, for R. Kelly, the end is 2019, where he's now finally going to receive justice. They say it's between 30 to 70 years that he could be serving. He's 51 now, so uh, by the time he comes out, he may either be dead already, or he won't have very long to live. He's seen the highs, and when I say highs, he's seen the highs, <laughs> and now you have seen the lows. So this just serves as a warning that um, final slide. We've seen various, various kings, various people who've named themselves kings of kings across time and they've had their various reasons and we've seen what happened to the nation of Israel when there was no king so the message I'm trying to drive on is as you can read there has to be amen amen In today's time that we specifically live in, it's a very postmodern time. And when I say postmodern, what it means is um, there's a sort of underlying thought that there's no real right and wrong. And there's no real correct answer. And everybody should do what they see fit in their own eyes. A lot like 1400 BC. And people are now following their heart, um, going with the flow, um, seeing what tomorrow brings, and seeing how it goes. Seeing how it goes is my favorite. Because, you know, you're not, you're not, then you're not saying yes or no, you're just. <laughs> I'll see how it goes. Even me, whenever people come to me and they're like, oh, so, so, so what do you want to do? Oh, do you want to like, come back to the uh, Please, please. I'm seeing how it goes. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, commit to anything. Right, let me. See how it goes. You're on the safer side. You know, everything is about liberties and freedom. <laughs> Let me be me. Let me express myself. The right to choose. The right to choose. You feel that? But there has to be yes, of course. Where does that fit into the blueprint God has set for us? With us, there has to be a king. Amen.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah.